This is episode 11 of Amos chapter 9, the last chapter of Amos. So here's Amos over here, contemporary of Jonah and Hosea. And he was active around 760 to 753 BC, just seven years in total. He preached during the rule of King Uzziah of Judah, which is here, who reigned for 52 years, and Jeroboam II of Israel here, who reigned for 41 years. And the reigns of the two kings overlapped for about 15 years. The north and the south were at the zenith of their power. They both experienced national stability, prosperity, and the expansion of their kingdoms. So here's a recap of Israel's enemies and what Amos says about them, and their cousins, also their enemies, what Amos says about them. And you can pause here and read this if you want to. Recap chapter 2, 3, and 4, and what Amos says about them. And you can pause if you want to recap and read this. Chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8. And you can pause and read this if you want to recap. Then the layout of Amos chapter 9. This is his judgment comes. We're on the final chapter of Amos. So let's dive into chapter 9. Israel is destroyed and restored. The symbolic vision of the doorpost. Verse 1. I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he said, Strike the doorposts, that the thresholds may shake, and break them on the heads of them all. I will slay the last of them with a sword. He who flees from them shall not get away, and he who escapes from them all shall not be delivered. So the Lord standing by the altar. So this altar is the illegitimate, perverted altar in Bethel. God has run out of patience. He refuses to accept their worship and refuses to be their God. Instead, he is poised to initiate the destruction from the very place, the altar, from which the people usually expect to get blessings. The destruction of the pagan temple or shrine in Bethel is where the idolatrous golden calf was installed. Other scholars think this applies to the temple in Jerusalem. Ultimately, both temples were destroyed. Samaria fell to the Assyrians in 722 BC. However, the shrine at Bethel apparently avoided destruction during the invasion. The shrine was finally destroyed by King Hosea of Judah. And the temple in Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians in 586 BC. He said, strike the doorposts on the heads of them all. So he said, strike the doorposts, break them on the heads of them all. So the capitals are the decorative supporting tops of the pillars. God will shatter the temple completely by striking the doorposts which then collapses the roof, crushing all the worshippers inside the shrine, meaning Israel's leaders will fall and the people crushed by their enemy. So these are the capitals, the doorposts. And you can see you don't need to bump down the columns. If you just knock out the doorposts, they're holding up the, the roof. And when these come down, the whole thing comes down. I will slay the last of them with the sword. Yeah, I will slay the last of them with the sword. Those not symbolically crushed or literally crushed by the Assyrian invaders, God orders their death by sword. He who flees, he who flees shall not get away. He who escapes shall not be delivered. Fugitives flee a calamity. Refugees seek refuge from calamities. Both types try to get as far away as possible, but will not be saved from destruction. All the people will die one way or the other. Verse 2, though they dig into hell, from there my hand shall take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. So dig into hell or climb up to heaven. There's no escaping the judgment of God. There's no place deep enough, nor any high enough. Nowhere in heaven or hell or anywhere in between. Nowhere can they escape God's fury. Even King David acknowledged this. Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Verse 3. And though they hide themselves on top of Carmel, from there I will search and take them. Though they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, from there I will command the serpent, and it shall bite them. 
So there they hide themselves on top of Carmel. So let me show you these maps. This was the, the land of Manasseh, the tribal land given to Manasseh. And this little ridge out here is where the mountain, Mount Carmel is. And then this here is the Jezreel Valley. So this map, I had to turn it around because it didn't, wasn't in the right direction otherwise. So this here is this little bump out with Mount Carmel here. And this here is the Sea of Galilee, Sea of Galilee, and Dead Sea, and Dead Sea with the River Jordan connecting them. So this is Mount Carmel. So though they hide themselves on top of Carmel, again God uses the extremes of the top of a mountain or the bottom of the sea and everything in between to illustrate the scope and range of his wrath. In the northern kingdom, you could hide on the flat top of Mount Carmel. It was a 12-mile range of hills in the land of Manasseh. Elijah ran and hid in the caves of Mount Carmel after he slaughtered 850 of Jezebel's false prophets, and she was chasing him. And God found Elijah there. No one can hide from God, though they hide at the bottom of the sea. After the sailors threw the rebellious Jonah overboard, he sank to the depths of the sea and died. Yet even in Hades, God found Jonah there. God created everything. There's no place to hide. The ancients believed that a giant snake-like creature lived at the depths of the sea. So God threatens that he will send the sea monster to bite them, thereby raking up all their ancient fears and superstitions. Verse 4. Though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword and it shall slay them. I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. Go into captivity before their enemies. These last three verses emphasize how utterly futile is the chance of escaping God's judgment. Even with the symbolic extremes of digging to hell or climbing to heaven or hiding in the mountains or the bottom of the sea, no one can escape. Now God says, even if you go into captivity, yet he will still find them and slay them, even in exile. The northerners mustn't think that if they go to a foreign land, that suddenly God will lose track of them. God punishes his own and protects his own. For example, Joseph's brother sold him into slavery, yet God protected him and he rose through the ranks until he was second only to the Pharaoh of Egypt. God decides who will rise and who will fall. And God has decided that the wicked north will fall. Psalm 139, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. Daniel 2, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. If you have done wrong, the best place to hide is in God, not from God. Just repent. God is a gracious God. When the Assyrians came and took them captive, they put a hook through their nose and led them off by their noses. I will set my eyes on them. If we think of hell heaven, we realize God is watching in spiritual dimensions. If we think of mountains in the bottom of the sea, then God is watching in vertical dimensions from top to bottom. If they go into captivity to a foreign land, then God is watching in horizontal dimensions from side to side. So it doesn't matter where they go, God will follow them in any dimension. This shatters their belief that their little gods are territorial is what they believed and therefore cannot punish them outside set boundaries. God sets them straight, up or down, side to side, even in hell, God will find them. Every avenue of escape is cut off. And the Assyrians had this habit of taking the people out of their land and distributing them in all the other lands that they had conquered so that they were no longer a cohesive nation and they could rebel. So that's what they did. So, But even if they go, wherever they go, every avenue of escape is cut off. The preservation of Israel. Verse 5. The Lord God of hosts, he who touches the earth and it melts, and all who dwell there mourn. All of it shall swell like the river and subside like the river of Egypt, the Lord God of hosts. This is the Lord Yahweh of hosts, the creator of the elements, hell, heaven, mountain, sea. This title in the Bible often refers to God of the armies of Israel or God as judge, judging people and nations. He who touches the earth and it melts. God controls the volcanoes, and the molten lava that flows from them. Psalm 46, the nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice and the earth melted. 
His power is unavoidable and irresistible. You cannot stop what is coming. So why didn't they just change their behavior? Because they simply didn't believe what God was saying. Why? Because these wicked people still believed they were his chosen. As the saying goes, there are none so blind as those that won't see. Or as Amos must have felt, you can take a horse to the water, but you can't make him drink. In Matthew 11, Jesus says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. <laughs> the north is not hearing. In Revelation, Jesus has the same problem when he sends seven letters to the seven churches, and these are them here. Jesus warns them over and over, Listen, take heed, beware. In Revelation 2 and Revelation 3, these different uh, verses, Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So clearly listening and obeying are not intuitive traits of we humans. We don't like to hear bad news. Even Amaziah, the high priest at Bethel, told Amos to scram, go back to Judah. Why? Because the leaders of the northern kingdom could not tell the truth that their religion was man-made, just fake. If they did, they would have to demolish all their pagan shrines stop all the lucrative temple prostitution, and the rich would have to stop oppressing the poor. The leaders and fake priests would have to advocate the people travel to Jerusalem to the real temple anointed by God, the legitimate one. And worse, they would lose all that delicious money, the tithes and offerings. The stakes were simply too high. So they stuck with the illegitimate one. That's why they didn't just change their behavior, because it's always about the money. Tithes and offerings here, or tithes and offerings here. Always about the money. It shall swell and subside like the river of Egypt. Again, as he did in chapter 8, Amos compares the rise and fall of the nation with the annual flooding and subsiding of the river Nile. Perhaps Amos uses the river of Egypt as an example because many of the gods and goddesses of Israel were originally based on Egyptian sorcery like Isis and Horos, the wife and son of Osiris, the Nile god, or like the occult Ra, the magic sun god. And here we have the sun god. Verse 6. He who built his layers in the sky and has founded his strata in the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. Who built his layers in the sky. This contrasts the all-powerful scale of God to the puny scale of man. God created the protective atmosphere of the upper layers. He created the sun and moon and stars in the middle layers. He created clouds in the lower layers with rains and pours them out on the face of the earth. And God enclosed it all with a firmament. Yet when God looks down on the northern kingdom, he doesn't see a nation living better than others. Instead, they live even lower, more debased than their surrounding nations. America was raised upon Christian principles, yet today the land is more debauched than any other nation on earth. We invented Halloween, an occult festival of witches and warlocks, and exported it to other countries. We condone two homosexual men marrying and adopting little boys that they viciously rape, put the shocking videos on social media as child porn, and pimp out the adopted boys to other pedophiles. And that's okay. We condone almost a million, a million children going missing every year, and we never look for them because their loss is by design. Massive child trafficking of American children, and that's okay. And if you don't believe these numbers, you can look it up. In 2022, 800,000 American children went missing under the Biden administration, and that's okay. It's no surprise that today we have tens of thousands of empty churches all across America. And there are so many abandoned churches that people buy them and turn them into their family home. Billy Graham famously said, if God does not punish America, then he should apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. This is 21 million, 20, let me say that slowly, 21 million people worldwide are victims of human trafficking right now and 50% of those victims are estimated to be children 
10 million children right now being trafficked and raped all around the world. Shocking. The Lord is his name. There's no mistaking who the northern kingdom has offended. Amos 5, we're in Amos 9. He made the Pleiades and Orion. He turns the shadow of death into morning and makes the day dark as night. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Verse 7. Are you not like the people of Ethiopia to me, O children of Israel, says the Lord? Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt, the Philistines from Capital, and the Syrians from Kerr? Are you not like? God asks a rhetorical question that ought to be answered with a yes. We are all God's children, even though the Jews are granted special privileges and the Torah, the law of Moses. Ethiopia, Egypt, Philistines, and Syria. God reminds them that he brought them out of Egypt, but he also brought out the Philistines from Capital and the Arameans from Kur, which is like way there by the um, other side of the Tigris. So Amos points out that, yes, the Israelites are special, but they're not the only ones that God rescued. Because of her repeated sinfulness, Israel has been scattered to foreign lands, but she will be restored. Ultimately, there will be no Israeli fugitives or refugees in foreign lands. All will be restored, all 12 tribes of Israel. Did I not bring up Israel from Egypt? Their rebellious idolatry has robbed the Exodus of all special meaning for the North. Her miraculous escape from Egypt is reduced to no more significance than the movement of any other people, like the Ethiopians, Philistines, or Syrians. God reminds the North where they came from, slavery in Egypt. And because of her idolatrous behavior, Israel could not rely on God's previous blessings as an assurance of future benevolence. Amos 3, we're in Amos 9, says, Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquity. This should be a humbling revelation for Israel, that God cares for all and punishes all. Verse 8. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. The eyes of the Lord are on the sinful kingdom. God is watching. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time. He's omnipotent. God is all-powerful. He can do anything at any time. And he's omniscient. God is all-knowing. Israel is his chosen. Yet the idolatry is far worse than the sins of other nations. In Amos chapter 1, God even lists these other pagan nations, the enemies that surround Israel. Amos 1, in all these verses, in Amos 2, verse 1, he says, For three transgressions of Damascus, which Syria of Gaza, of Tyre, of Edom, of Ammon, and for three transgressions of Boab, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. So God even lives to that are. The Bible reminds us repeatedly that God is watching. Psalm 33 the Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. Jeremiah 23. Can anyone hide himself in secret places, so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? Revelation 2 and 3. In both chapters, Jesus says seven times to the seven churches, I know your work. But Jesus is watching. I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. The scope now enlarges to all 12 tribes of Israel. The northern nation, as a political entity, will be destroyed, but not all will be destroyed. God will spare a remnant of Jacob, even in their exile. Jeremiah 30, For I am with you, says the Lord, to save you, though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered you. Yet I will not make a complete end of you. But I will correct you in justice and will not let you go altogether unpunished. 
And God did make a full end of all nations where he scattered them. Verse 9. For surely I will command and will sift the house of Israel among all nations as grain is sifted in a sieve. Yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. Sift the house of Israel among the nations. The final processing of harvested grain is sifting to remove unwanted debris and impurities and leave only the pure grain kernels. Similarly, God sifted the ancient pagan nations and removed them. There are no pure Aramaeans today, no Philistines, no Phoenicians. Their DNA is obliterated. There are no Edomites today, no Ammonites, no Moabites. Their DNA is obliterated. Other nations of mixed hybrid genes, like the Samaritans, occupy their ancestral land. Grain is sifted in a sieve. Is as grain is sifted in a sieve. So the northern kingdom will be sifted, and the nation cleansed of the worshippers of the golden calf false religion. Yet God never lost all his chosen children. He kept track of them, and today he has restored them to their land, modern Israel. Yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. The debris is caught, and only the pure grain drops through, and the refuse is discarded. God would not allow even one repentant person to perish. Even if they are taken into captivity and scattered in foreign lands, God would restore the penitent. Deuteronomy 30, if any of you are driven out to the furthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And this is certainly true of modern Israel today. Verse 10. All the sinners of my people die by the sword. You say, the calamity shall not overtake nor confront us. All the sinners of the people. All of the north will die for their sins. Like the Babylonian king Belshazzar, God has weighed Israel in the balance and found them wanting. The calamity shall not overtake us or confront us. Those in the northern kingdom, wallowing in idolatry and iniquity, still claim that God would never harm them. They looked forward to Judgment Day when they fully expected God to rain down terrors on their enemies, but not themselves. They are blinded by euphoria. But Amos puts them straight. They won't be that lucky. Amos 5 says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. The restoration of Israel. Verse 11. On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. On that day. During the end times, this verse is regarded as messianic and indicates a time of either judgment or redemption. Here Amos is prophesying that after their judgment, comes their restoration. Deuteronomy 30, Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Israel, the only country in the world that bears the same name, speaks the same language, upholds the same faith, and inhabits the same land as it did 3,000 years ago. Pretty amazing. In 1948, Israel was once again recognized as a nation and the Jews started to return to the land. Additionally, God said they would occupy their ancestral land and this is also partly true today. Elat, the Edomite Red Sea port city, is now back in the hands of Israel. Therefore, can we conclude that we are in the end time? Has on that day arrived? I will raise up. This is the first of three promises of God, I will raise up. Restoration is not just prophesied in Amos, but runs through the entire Old Testament from Genesis 3 on. God may reject Israel now, but ultimately he will restore them. And today Israel, a tiny country, keeps all their Arab neighbors at bay. 
So this is Israel. This itty bitty bit, and look at all the Arab neighbors that hate them. And there's this tiny little piece over here. You can barely see it on the map. Still to come in that day, God will restore their royal family, the national life of Israel. God's will was that Israel would be a kingdom, not a republic. But to be a kingdom, you need a king, King Jesus, sitting on the royal throne of David, per the unconditional Davidic covenant, which was reiterated to Mary. Hosea 3, for the children of Israel shall abide many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. King Jesus will not only rule over Israel as a political entity, but also rule over the entire world. That tiny land will be the seat of the ruler of the whole world. Organizations like the WEF, UN, EU, and NATO, to name a few, will all be gone. Israel will be the global power. And then the world will truly have one nation under God, one world religion, one army of God under King Jesus. So, the Tabernacle of David. Don't confuse the Tabernacle of David with Solomon's Temple. I will raise up the Tabernacle of David. Isaiah refers to the Tabernacle of David prophetically, stating that one will arise from the line of David who will sit on the throne of David. This refers to King Jesus. Isaiah 16, In mercy the throne will be established, and one will sit on it in truth, in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking justice and hastening righteousness. David's tabernacle, understanding God's plan for the end time church. 750 years later, James, the brother of Jesus, later than Amos, the brother of Jesus and head of the church in Jerusalem, quoted Amos at the Council of Jerusalem when a dispute arose as to what exactly was required of Christian Gentiles. James said that Jesus relieved them of the Moses law, and we are saved by faith, not by works. And this was a pivotal event in Christian, for Christians, because up until then, they were trying to uh, impose a Moses law on the Christians, and they argued that, no, that wasn't true. We were saved by faith, not by works. So I'm repeating verse 11 here, just for convenience. On that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. After some discussion by the council of Jerusalem, the elders sent a letter to the Gentiles clarifying their stand. Acts 15. Simon, Peter, has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agreed, just as it is written, and now he quotes Amos. After this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. So here he's quoting Amos. Acts 15, a few verses later. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idol, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. So James says that the tabernacle of David means that God will take from the Gentiles a people from himself, that is, the church. And the time of the Gentiles, the church, has been for the last 2,000 years. So verse 12, that they may possess the remnants of Eden and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing. Possess the remnants of Eden. Eden is used symbolically to represent all Israel's enemies. The restored Israel will extend to the boundaries under Solomon and his United Kingdom, plus whatever is left of Edom, their bitter enemy, plus all the other surrounding enemy lands. All the Gentiles who are called by my name. So King David ruled over many nations surrounding his United Kingdom. Now the future King Jesus will rule over many nations too. He will rule over the whole world, including all Israel's former enemies. This will fulfill the unconditional Abrahamic and Davidic covenants. So unconditional meant God, it was up to God to perform these, uh, the truth of these covenants and not up to us. So the Abrahamic covenant 
was that God said he would bless Abraham's offspring so that they were as plentiful as the stars in the sky or the sand on the beach. And the, the land covenant was, he said, I'm giving you the promised land for you to occupy and possess. The Davidic covenant, all of these were unconditional. The Davidic covenant was, he told King David, that one of his line, that a person, that a king from his line would emerge and, uh, and rule on the throne of David, which of course is Jesus. And the everlasting covenant in Jeremiah 31, 31, was that God will have a new covenant with Israel and Judah. The covenant will be a new covenant, not like the one he had with their ancestors. It will be a whole new covenant that he will write on their hearts. Says the Lord who does this thing. David's throne will be re-established in the end time. This prophecy of the future King Jesus has not been fulfilled yet, but it will be. Why? Because God does what he says he will do. Glorious Eden-like prosperity. Verse 13. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. The plowman overtake the reaper. Amos verse 12 up above was political, but now Amos turns to the agricultural restoration. The abundance of the Lord will be so bountiful that the seasons will run together continuously, so that sowing and reaping will be without interval. Just an unbroken supply of fresh produce throughout the year. As the reapers reap, so the plowman will be coming right behind him, sowing new seeds in the field. So here you, here's an illustration. So while the, the, they're harvesting the old crop, the new crop, the intermediate crop is there. And meanwhile, he's sowing more seeds over here. So they've got, in Israel, this is already happening. They have three crops, two to three crops a year. And already this exactly happens in Israel today. The plowman follows right behind the reaper, sowing the new seed, and they are getting two to three crops per year. They are the breadbasket of the Middle East, and the abundance feeds their neighboring nations. They even produce enough fresh water to pipe it to surrounding nations. This abundance is a complete reversal of the curses of Amos 4. Now the farmers are hardly able to keep up with the prolific bounty. Leviticus 26 your threshing shall last till the time of vintage, and the vintage shall last till the time of sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. God, the creator of all things, will provide this abundance. Romans 11, for of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. To God be all the glory, the honor, and the praise. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine. Joel, another prophet, foretold the same thing as Amos. In Joel 3, he said, And it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine. The hills shall flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Acacias. The literal mountains today are part of the West Bank and controlled by the Arab Palestinian Authority. So this land must be reclaimed by Israel, as God promised, and drip with sweet wine. Mountains are also a symbolic reference to God's government, and his rule will be as sweet as wine. Verse 14, I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. This is a picture of the orchards in Israel today. I mean, just look at this abundance. Wow, just, they shall plant vineyards and drink wine. They shall make gardens and eat fruit from them. Look at that abundance. They work for it, though. My people Israel. This is in sharp contrast to the book of Hosea and earlier chapters of Amos where God rejected the northern kingdom. Hosea 1, then God said, Call his name lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. In Amos 7, God does call them his people, even though they are disobedient and deserve judgment. Amos 7 says, And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, A plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. In the future, in that day, 
all is forgiven and God will take back my people Israel, restore them and bless them. In Ezekiel chapter 37, talks of the dry bones, the exiles, that God says he will cover the bones in flesh, put breath back into them and will restore Israel as one united nation. Here, this is Ephraim and Judah, Israel and Judah, the north and the south, re, um, reunited. They will be my people and I will be their God. And this happened in 1948. I will bring, they shall build, they shall plant. Verse 11, God promises, I will raise up their national life, their political life, their royal David line. In verse 14, God promises, this is verse 14, I will bring back their agricultural life. Restored to the promised land, God's people will be safe and secure, blessed and very productive. And while God fulfills his promises, he expects us to do our bit, to build, to plant, and to make gardens. This is not a one-sided blessing. Man must work in order to enjoy his restoration. And wow, look at that restoration. Verse 15. I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. I will plant them in the land. God made three promises to his chosen. Verse 11. He promised, I will raise up their national life. In verse 14, just the previous one God promised, I will bring them back their agricultural life, and in verse 15, God promises, I will plant them, their territorial life, their boundaries, their borders. While the people plant the vineyards and gardens, God promises to plant them in their own land. Israel and the promised land are one package. Israel occupying the promised land was conditioned upon her obedience to the Mosaic covenant that they saw at Mount Sinai. Deuteronomy 28 are all God's blessings provided they keep the Mosaic Covenant. And Deuteronomy 28 later on are all God's curses should they break the Mosaic Covenant. So you can see there's only 14 blessings, but there's, what, uh, 50, 53, 53 curses if they break it. However, even though they did break the covenant over and over, and although God did remove them from their land twice, once with the Assyrians and a second with the Babylonians, Nevertheless, God never rescinded his promise that the promised land was theirs to possess. So still to come, God will restore all Israel's boundaries as laid out in Numbers 34. Basically, from east to west, from the river Euphrates to the Mediterranean Sea. And from north to south is from southern Turkey to the Nile River in Egypt. So Israel's borders will be from the Nile to the Euphrates and everything in between. Revelation 21, Then he who sat on the throne said, Jesus, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. When God prophets say something, God means it. So all of this land should actually be Israel, not this tiny little piece here. And that's the West Bank, that white piece. They need to take that back too. The three promises in summary. Number one, Israel will again be a royal family and an imperial nation with King Jesus ruling over all the nations. So Israel is definitely not a monarchy yet. And nor are they an imperial nation all over the world yet. It's 2,000 years since Amos prophesied this promise of God. And we wait till Jesus comes again and sits on the throne of David. Meanwhile, as Christians, we are the spiritual heirs to the royal throne of Christ. Plus, the church is made up of all nations and all tongues. So the imperial church somewhat fulfills this prophecy. So this national promise is only partially fulfilled by the imperial church. And verse 2, that their agriculture would be so prolific that they would get multiple crops per year. And this is certainly true already. So this agricultural promise is fulfilled. Promise 3, Israel would get their land back and would never be removed again. So they're back in their land, but can they be plucked out again? No. In 1948, they got their land back. And God said he would plant them never to be removed. And that's good enough for me. So this territorial promise is fulfilled. Although not as much as this. This is what we want to see from Numbers 34. So this is the end of chapter 9. It's actually the end of the book of Amos, where Israel is God threatens to destroy Israel and then restores it. 
In Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33, God says, The day is coming, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Jeremiah. God says also in Jeremiah 31.3, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. So nice to have an everlasting love. So before you go, let me pray over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Shalom. God bless you. Actually, I'm going to repeat that for America. The Lord bless America and keep America. The Lord make his face shine upon America and be gracious to America. The Lord turn his face toward America and give America peace. Shalom. God bless. Thank you for sitting with me through nine chapters of Amos. God bless you.